chapter 3 and verse 1. This is what the Apostle wrote. He said, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Now, you see, when you're a child of someone, it means something. And to be God's child, that comes with certain privileges. It comes with certain blessings. Of all the people we could be a child of, we are called children of God. And that's a huge thing. So I want to share some thoughts about God's fatherhood. And the first thing I want to say is this. Jesus shows us what God the Father is like. In John 14, verse 9, Jesus speaking to Philip said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. What a thing to say. And so when you think about God, what is God like? The first person you should be thinking of is Jesus. He who has seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. So many people have different ideas about what God is like, but if Jesus is not at the forefront of that thought, then it's an inaccurate picture of God. I'm glad that Jesus is the one who shows us what God is like and no one else, because even so-called men of God have behaved in ways that is totally foreign to the ways of God. But we don't follow them, we follow Jesus, amen? And he shows us God the Father perfectly. Now, how is it that Jesus can show us what God is like? One reason is that he knows the Father better than anyone else. It's always interesting hearing what people say about someone. But really, the people that know that person best are the ones that live with that person. And often, somebody's public image can be very different, positively and negatively, than the real way that person is behind closed doors. But Jesus knows God the Father better than anyone else. And he said in Matthew eleven twenty seven, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills or chooses to reveal him. So Jesus knows God better than anyone else. After all, he's been with God forever. Okay, and so he knows God better than anyone, which is why he can show us the Father perfectly. But there's another reason, and it's because Jesus is the Son of the Father. So in that phrase, the Son of God, God there is God the Father. He's not saying he's the Son of the whole Trinity. In particular, he's the Son of the Father. And because of that, you see, there's a saying, like father, like son. And Jesus is in very nature God. He's the son of God. And so he shows us the father perfectly. Now, Jesus came to share this father with us. Please understand that if you go back 10 trillion years, you have the father and the son, and they have this love relationship going on. And Jesus came to share his Father with us. And in Matthew 6, verse 9, he said, In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven. Jesus wants his Father to be our Father. And when Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to Mary, we read in John 20, 17, that Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Jesus' Father has become our Father too. Now this is not a theoretical relationship. It is a relationship that is made real in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, in Galatians 4, verse 6, Paul wrote, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Now, I want to say something. Christianity 
is boring without the Holy Spirit. Okay? If Christianity is boring to anyone, then that person hasn't really experienced the Holy Spirit or is not living them, their faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes this thing real. All right? it, it goes from theory to a, a real lived experience. Now, the Spirit of God's Son, Jesus, has been given to us so that we can cry, Abba, Father. And Abba is an Aramaic word that means Father. Now, notice it says crying out. Everyone say crying out. So this indicates that this is a heartfelt cry. Anyone can say, Father God, you are amazing, amen. But when you cry out, Father, now something deep is going on there. There's an actual power, an energy in you that is driving this cry. And where does this phrase, Abba, Father, come from? Well, in Mark's Gospel, Mark 14, verse 36, when Jesus was about to be crucified, we read the following. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. So notice that Jesus called God Abba, Father. And the Holy Spirit produces that same cry in us. And I really want to encourage all of us to ask God, to seek God, that we may truly be filled every day with the Spirit. And it's not about whether or not you speak in tongues, it's about being filled with the presence of God, okay? And however that manifests itself. And what's important is that you get to know God for who He is. And it's only the Holy Spirit that can make that happen. You know, what is the simple key to prayer. If I had to narrow it down to just one thing, what would I say? It would probably be this, pray from the heart. And that simply means that you mean what you say. You really engage your heart in what you're doing. Um, you see, wh whatever our spiritual practices are, they have to be able to work in good times and bad. They have to be able to work when we are strong and when we are weak. And so, you, you know, it's good that we can do things that require strength. And let me say this, within Pentecostalism, and I've been Pentecostal for quite some time, the emphasis is often on what we do. The emphasis is on us striving, praying through, spending long hours in prayer. And that's all good. The Bible speaks about striving in prayer. But the problem is, is that when we depend on that, what do you do when you are weak? And you can't do that. Whatever your spiritual practice is, you, you need something that will work in all seasons. And the journey up to God is a journey down into your innermost being, where you connect with God in your heart. You can just sit there. You know, I'm, well, I was going to say I'm preaching, um, I think many teachers may possibly have a secret desire that they are, would be preachers. Um, because it feels good to preach, you know. And I remember ages ago, one Sunday, giving a sermon, and, you know, I'm preaching. And someone said, that was a good teaching. I'm like, <laughs> I'm preaching. But anyway, the point I'm making is, if I need to do cartwheels and stand up to speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, something's wrong because I should be able to just sit and talk. It can't always be human energy and human strength. So an authentic relationship with God, you can walk and pray, you can jump and pray, but you need to be able to sit and pray. You need to be able to connect with God instantly. And the way to do that is to just pray from your heart. Mean what you say. You don't have to say much, but when you praise God from your heart, that's how you connect with him. And if I had to narrow this down to one thing, it would be that. Pray from your heart. Now, as I have said, Jesus came to share his Father with us. And as such, in Christ, we have access to God. And one of the games the devil will play is to try and tell you that you don't. And when I say he will try and tell you that you don't, I don't mean he appears, you know, at the end of your bed um, with a pitchfork, and wearing leotards 
with two horns. Um, no, what he does is he tries to make you feel guilty. Um, he reminds you of your past. He wants you to feel this spiritual filth that you're not worthy to approach God. But the only acceptable way for you to approach God is with confidence. Not self-confidence, as wonderful as self-confidence is, but confidence in the power of this detergent called the blood of Jesus. It washes us clean. And, you know, listen, we live in the world and we are in these fleshly bodies. Bad thoughts will come to us. Okay? Um, someone said the devil tries to put thoughts in your head and then condemns you for having them. But look, bad thoughts will come, whether it's from the flesh or the devil or what, but you need to trust in the power of the blood of Jesus to wash you completely clean. You see, God knows you're human, by the way. Uh, human beings were his idea. He created us. He knows you are human. Jesus himself became human. He knows what you have to deal with, and he still accepts you. And so in Ephesians 2.18, it says, through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. And then in Ephesians 3, verse 12, it says, in whom, that's in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Not through faith in ourselves. You see, if you look at yourself, you will be eventually depressed. <laughs> All right, if you just look within yourself, there's not much hope there. Um, and you could probably tell I'm not a motivational speaker. Um, but it's true. Um, you need to look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and trust in the power of his blood to cleanse you from all sin. Now, here's the next thing I want to say um, about God's fatherhood and us being a child of God. You know that you belong to God. Amen. Now, what am I talking about? You see, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus... You have a knowing within yourself that you belong to God. And whilst various thoughts may arise in your mind, in your spirit, there is a knowing that you belong to God. And this is important because in life there will be times where we may have various thoughts, doubts even, questioning things. Um, but for the person who's been born again, Despite all the questions, and such a person may not have all the answers to the questions that may, might arise in their minds, but there is a knowing in the spirit, in your spirit, that you belong to God. So it's like when um, Jesus was speaking and the multitudes were following him, and then the multitudes left him um, because, you know, he was talking truth. And Jesus had a way... Um, of pouring fuel on fire. I mean, he saw people following him, and he's like, yes, I've got, look at this Twitter following I have, all of these thousands. What can I do? I know I'll offend them, and they will leave me, and that's what happened. And then he, after all the people left him, he then turns to his disciples and says, you going to go too? You think, wouldn't he be trying to retain what he's got left? But he says, are you going to go too? And they said, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And when you are connected to God, when you have given your life to him, put your faith in Jesus and you become God's child, there's a knowing that you belong to him. And it's something that is perhaps beyond anything I can articulate. Because it's beyond the realm of logic and theory. It's, it's this knowing that I belong to God. And Paul describes this in Romans 8.16. He says, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So there's this knowing in our spirit that we belong to God, we are his children. I may not have all the answers to everything that happens in my life, but this I know, I belong to God. And that's from God. And so what am I saying? Go with what you know. Right? Just go with what you know. You, it's, and this is a knowing beyond anything the brain has the ability to fully get or express, as you can tell by my feeble attempts to try and articulate it. This is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the next thing I want to say about God's fatherhood. God has chosen you to be his child. 
No one can come to God unless God himself draws that person to himself. In James 1.18, watch this closely, James wrote, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. So the word of God here called the word of truth is the means by which we have been born again. We've heard the word about the good news about Jesus Christ. We have believed it and that word has entered our heart and caused us to be born anew. Now, what I want you to note is that it says of his own will, he brought us forth. In other words, your salvation in as much as you may think it was your decision, it was actually God's. Remember, Jesus said to the disciples, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Now, how does that work? When Jesus said, follow me to the disciples, and they said, yes, Lord, we shall follow you. I mean, it's, it's really like a bizarre thing when we read this in the Bible, where Jesus just randomly, apparently, says to these disciples, follow me. And they did. It's like, what? Did I, did I miss something in the storyline there? I mean, have you tried that? Going to the street and saying, follow me. <laughs> and someone says, yes, I will follow you. I mean, this is very interesting. Now, didn't those disciples choose to follow Jesus? Didn't they have to make some kind of decision to do so? Perhaps, but Jesus gets the credit. I don't fully understand it. I believe we have free will, but as you've heard me say, I believe God's free will is freer than ours. And so Jesus says, follow me, and they followed. And he said to them, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And here James says, it is of God's own will that he brought us forth. You see, when you belong to God, it's very difficult for you to run away from him. And God will make it difficult for you. Uh, I just pronounce this blessing on your life that if you try and run away from God, it just won't feel right. You're going to stick out in a sore, like a sore thumb. If you try and, it, it'd be like a, you know, when you're trying to force a jigsaw puzzle piece to fit in the puzzle and it just doesn't fit. That's like you trying to go back into the world, and, the, and when God has his hand on you, really, um, at some point you've got to yield, all right, and God knows how to get us, and look, God has chosen each and every one of you to be his child of his own will. Now, that ought to make you feel loved, and this is so important because if you are trying to earn spiritual privilege in God's sight. You can't do it. The, the foundation has to be God's love for you. And you can't grow spiritually if you're not planted in that soil. The fact that God loves you, that he sent Jesus, his son, to die for you, to suffer for you, to take the penalty that we deserve for our sins. Jesus took it in our place so that we could participate in his relationship with the Father a relationship of love. And here's the other thing, if God chose you, then that must mean that he has a plan for you. Because it says in, to, in Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now, if you work, are working at something, you have a goal in mind. Why is God working in you? There must be a goal. And this gives us confidence that, you know what, in this life, God has a purpose for me. I'm not just existing. I may not fully understand what the purpose is, and none of us fully understand our purpose. We may think it's one thing, and God can completely change it, and it actually is something else. You have no idea um, what your potential is in Christ. Believe you me, I I'm not just using a phrase, you have no idea. And... We can think we know. And, you know, I like Abraham. He said, basically, he didn't know where he was going, it says. He followed God, but had no idea where he was going. God just said, leave the land of, you know, wherever you are and come with me and we're going to take you somewhere else. And he obeyed. 
And this is one of the wonderful things about God. God doesn't use perfect people. Abraham wasn't perfect. I mean, when you're reading Genesis and you get to certain episodes where your eyebrow just raises as you're reading it, but maybe you're, you're not sure if you have the right to feel that way because it's in the Bible, isn't it? But, you know, he, he will say um, to his wife, you know, hey, let's do a thing. You pretend to be my sister um, so that they won't you know, kill me because of you. And you're thinking, isn't that lying? And he, yes, it is. I mean, it was a half lie um, because she was, and this is the other odd thing that will make your eyebrow raise, he, she was his sister, but just by one parent, not both. Um, but notice what started as a partial lie in the next generation becomes a complete lie because his son Isaac says the same thing to his wife, except now his wife isn't his sister. And then it goes to another level with Isaac's child, Jacob, who's now known for deceiving. And this is where you have to deal with things in your life, because otherwise you can just continue certain cycles through generations that get worse, because they're not dealt with. But I'm going a bit away from the point of this sermon now. So let me come back to talking about God's fatherhood and our sonship. Sonship is something that we have and is also something that we are growing into. Now this is important to understand. In Matthew 5, 44 to 45, Jesus said this. He said, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I wonder how many of us do that. The, he didn't just say, have these things in your mind. We're actually supposed to do it. And so when somebody does us bad, we are actually supposed to get on our knees and pray for them. And we're not to pray that God would strike them. <laughs> we're to pray God's blessing on them. What a bizarre way to behave. Well, the, the rules of the kingdom of God are different than the standards of the world. And I'm glad Jesus did this himself. He prayed for his enemies. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But he continues. So he says, pray for them that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So Jesus' point here is that God blesses the evil and the good. Therefore, we shouldn't only love the good, but also our enemies too. He sends the blessing of rain on the evil and the good. He makes the sun rise on both. Now notice that Jesus said, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. We are already God's children now. Just so that we are all clear, in the language that Jesus spoke, it was a very masculine language. So the word sons, we just understand that are sons and daughters. Um, just like the word brothers, it was used for brothers and sisters. Um, so he says, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So here's the thing, we are already God's children. So why does he say, do this, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven? is because when we imitate God by blessing those who are unkind to us, we begin to behave like God's children. In other words, we begin to behave like someone who has been brought up by God. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Not that I know much about apples, but we did have an apple tree when I was a child in the garden. Um, didn't use them that often, but they were there but they were cooking apples. But um, this has absolutely nothing to do with the sermon <laughs> at this point. Now, no analogy coming, sorry, but yeah. So look, we are to grow into sonship. We are to behave like we are children of God. And our sonship will reach another level when Jesus comes. Right now we are born again in a spiritual sense, but the day is coming when our physical being will also be born anew, uh, when we are raised from the dead. Now, in Romans 8, 22 to 23, Paul said, 
For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So in other words, creation is in turmoil right now, okay? And we, we know that. But not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, that's the first installment of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now this is very interesting. So right now, you and I have the first installment of the Holy Spirit. But the day is coming when the Holy Spirit will take over our bodies completely. See, we haven't experienced that yet. This is why, as I keep saying to you, my beard begins to get white hairs, all right? It's all part of the fact that, listen, our body is corruptible. We have, our bodies have not been glorified yet. In this body, we have groanings, and we all know that. And um, we can pretend that that's not the case. Um, some preachers do but I can assure you it is the case, and all of us will find that out. Uh, none, of, none of you run as fast as you used to be able to run. I, mean, I remember the day I realized that I couldn't run as fast as I used to. I was born with speed. Well, I say born, it didn't happen when I was a baby. <laughs> but it was in my genes. I could run fast. I was, I mean, we never found out who really was the fastest in my school. That showdown never happened. But, you know, it was either me or someone else. And... Um, <laughs> I was born, I never trained for it. I never trained for it. Um, and that was, I guess, in one sense a bad thing because I then didn't know how to maintain it because it was just what I had. But I remember the day I found out that I couldn't run as fast as I used to. I mean, it was somebody's birthday celebration and they were having this obstacle course thing. And in the last bit of the obstacle course, there was this straight bit where you just run. And I started running. I'm like, I'm not moving as fast as I normally would be if I'm exerting this kind of, you know, effort. I thought, listen, maybe it was the trainers, I thought. No, okay. They were Reebok. I didn't usually um, grow up with Reebok, Reebok trainers. Nothing wrong with Reebok. I'm just saying I, that's not what I used when I was um, younger. And then I thought not too much about it. I just remember the feeling till this day, as you can tell. And I was at another event. This was a baby dedication. And they were also doing this outdoor thing. And people had heard about my speed. And... <laughs> There was this race that went on, and I thought, yeah, let me, you know, go and, you know, do this race. And the Lord, you see, he's merciful. He tried to warn me, don't do this, Stuart, don't embarrass yourself. And so I, there were two, two races, because there was quite a number of people. And I went in the first one, and as I s started to sprint, my keys fell out of my pocket. So I had to stop and pick them up, and I thought, I'll just go in the next race. But that was really the Lord saying, no, don't. It's just, I'm trying to spare you. You, you. you don't know that you can't run as fast as you used to. So I went in the um, next race, and I just was not running as fast as I once could. I thought, what's happened? Well, no mystery. We are in these earthly bodies, and they, you know, we, we do well to look after them as best as we can, but there's groanings in these bodies, and we are awaiting for what he calls the adoption what on earth does that mean, the adoption? He says it's the redemption of our bodies. And, you see, we have already been adopted by God as his children, but our adoption is currently incomplete. Um, it will be completed when we are made fully like the Son of God, because he is our destiny, to be like him. And he has been glorified with an immortal, unchangeable body, um, well, an immortal, glorious body, I should say, and we will also, we will be made fully like the Son of God. And that is when our adoption is complete. And not only that, but the world will be renewed as well, which is why we want Jesus to come. Now, because God is your Father, you don't need to worry about anything. In Philippians 4, 6-7, Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, let me pause there. This is so important. You've heard me quote this verse many times, and I will intend to continue doing so, because we know the verse. We know what it says. 
but we can know a verse and all of us can forget to do what it says. You see, so there is an antidote for anxiety and it's called prayer. In everything, everyone say everything, by prayer and supplication. So I understand that simply to mean pray until you've prayed. You see, you can pray and you haven't really prayed. You've just said the words, but you haven't really fully meant it. You haven't really transferred the burden over to God. You're still holding on to it. You're saying, God, take this. Actually, I'm just going to hold a bit of it too. No, no, no. You pray until you've prayed. And he says, with thanksgiving. Now, if you have medication, it has instructions on how you are to use it. It's hay fever season, so you may need to take some kind of something for hay fever, but you've got to follow the instructions. Now, this medicine bottle has instructions. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. If you don't add the thanksgiving, I can't guarantee whether or not this will work. I'm not saying it won't, I'm just not guaranteeing it will. And we have to give God thanks. Why? One thing thanksgiving does is it reminds us of how faithful God has been to us. And thanksgiving, you see, how do we engage with God? Worship is so important. Thanksgiving is so important. This is how, this is all part of the spiritual language. This is how we pray to God. We give him thanks. We worship him. It helps us to actually experience him because he then says in the next verse, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, here's the wonderful thing. This peace passes understanding. The Bible says, do not lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. When we are in the, in the middle of something, we won't always understand how God will deal with the situation or understand what's going on, but the peace of God surpasses understanding. It's a supernatural peace that comes from God himself. This peace that you just know, you know what, God has got this covered. I don't need to spend any more effort worrying. It will achieve nothing. God has got this sorted out. But you, you're not guaranteed to experience that peace unless you do what he says. Pray with thanksgiving. Now then, in Matthew 6, 25 to 34, well-known words, I will read them to you. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, not about, nor about the body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And this is applicable right now in these uncertain times in which we live. Um, Jesus says, don't worry. His message doesn't change. Don't worry. Um, you know, in the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, he taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. It's a challenging request. One of the amazing things about the Lord's Prayer is it's difficult. It's so easy, but it's difficult because as you're praying it, if you're really thinking about what you're saying, it provokes certain questions in you. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, here's the thing. You know full well in our context today for the most, most of us that the food in your cupboard probably is not only for today. It's also for tomorrow. Um, if you have a freezer, you may have things, you know, that, you know, should something happen, you know, if, um, you know, ne if next time it's not the toilet tissue people are after, but um, something else. You might have stuff in your freezer that will sustain you for a little while. Um, so give us this day our daily bread. And it's okay to think, to be honest, God, I actually already have, you know, stuff in my cupboard for today and tomorrow. So what's going on there? Can we still pray that? Interestingly, Luke puts, give us day by day our daily bread. But even so, in Matthew's gospel, it's give us this day our daily bread. Now, here's the thing, and this is what I want us to get. By praying that, we are acknowledging our creaturely dependence on God. We are acknowledging, you know what, thank you that you've given me strength to work and to earn and so that I can buy food, but the fact that I'm saying to you, give me this day my daily bread, I'm acknowledging that I'm dependent on you ultimately for my provision. And that's important. We must truly depend on him. And so praying the Lord's Prayer, and it's a wonderful prayer to pray, 
it helps us to really make sure we are trusting in God as our source and not trusting in ourselves. Now, Jesus said, next, he says, look at the birds of the air, he continues, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? In other words, worrying doesn't achieve anything. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry. Everyone say, do not worry. Do not worry. Now, when you do something that God tells you not to do, that's disobedient. And so when worry comes, because worrying thoughts may come to you, but you need to make a decision and say, I'm not going to worry. I refuse to. And it's not that you do nothing instead, because if you, you know, they're saying nature abhors a vacuum. If you try and do nothing, it doesn't work. You have to replace worry with something else. And what did Paul say? He said, don't be anxious for anything, but in all circumstances, pray. Pray with prayer and supplication. Make your request known to God. So we replace worry with prayer. And you transfer the burden to God. Now, he says, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Worry is manifest in certain times by questions. Notice he says, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? So, in other words, when you have faith, you don't question certain things. Worry manifests itself by asking questions. That's a sobering thought, but it's an interesting thought. What questions are going on in your mind? You see, if you really want to attack anxiety, you need to attack those questions that are in your mind. I could worry about all kinds of things. I have my challenges too. I could worry about this, that, and the other. And if I find myself asking questions like, how am I going to be able to cope? How am I going to be able to get through this? What's going to happen X, Y, Z? You know what I'm doing? I'm worrying. I could pretend I'm not worrying, but I am. And so I need to challenge the questions in my mind and say, hold on, stop asking such questions. God is my source. He will show me what to do. He will bring me through this victoriously. So he says, for after all these things were studied to the Gentile seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So in other words, nature abhors a vacuum. You cannot simply stop worrying. You have to do something in its place. And what does Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Get busy serving God. Focus on his work and he will take care of whatever concerns you. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Don't worry. That's not who God has called you to be. You might say, well, how can I help it if I worry? Well, you can do what God says, pray, seek God's kingdom first. I emphasize this because when we are in the situation, it's so easy to forget. When our emotions are all involved and so on, we can forget to do the very thing that God said. It's like having, I'm sorry, I'm just using Haiti because it's the season as an example, and I know some of you have been suffering with it. But it's like having a tablet, and I know not all tablets work for everyone, but it's like having a tablet, whether it's hay fever or something else, and you're faced with whether it be pain or whatever, and instead of taking the tablet, you start complaining about the pain or the discomfort. And it's like, okay, um, we've given you a remedy for the pain, for the hay fever, whatever it is. Just take the tablet, and you'll be fine. But instead, you, you're like, no, I'm going to worry. I'm going to worry about the pollen. And I know about hay fever, by the way, because I 
get it myself. I haven't been struck with it this year, thank God. Now that I've said it, probably will be, but <laughs> I'm just using this as an example. Um, so it's like worrying about the pollen when you have a remedy. And I use that as an analogy of worrying. We can keep on worrying, and the worrying is there. It's like the pollen. Um, just a bit of Bible trivia. Um, where it says resist the devil, firm in the faith, that word resist, it's actually the word in Greek from which we get our English word antihistamine. Um, probably won't help you much in life, but there you go. Um, but the point is, worry like pollen is there. There are seasons when it comes, but we have something to take for it. We have prayer with thanksgiving. We have seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We have something we can do, so let's not worry about tomorrow. Let's let tomorrow worry about itself. Let's trust in God. Now, I also want to say this. The Father will only give us what is good. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11, Jesus is speaking. And he says this, he says, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there, what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him. God is a generous father, but he will only give you what is good for you. Remember that. Because there will be times in our life where we want something, but God knows it will be bad for us. God knows best. Faith is not demanding that God do some particular thing. It is knowing that God can do anything and trusting him to make whatever decision is best and knowing that his decision is for the best. That's what faith is. Because God is not a genie in the bottle that we can summon. He's not our servant, by the way. We are his. Let's not get it twisted. He is God and he deserves to be worshipped as God. We don't. He doesn't work for us. God will give us what is good. In 1 John 5, 14 to 15, it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. God will always do what is right and what is best for us. It's not about getting our way all of the time. Um, faith is a relationship. It's not a formula. And many times we can treat it as though it is. Why didn't God do this when I wanted him to do such and such a thing? We've all had such things happen where we have wanted God to do one thing and he's not done it. We've also had it where God has. God does what he determines is best. And we won't have all the answers now, but one day we will. We will see him. But here's the th wonderful thing about faith. Remember what Paul said, the peace of God surpasses understanding. Listen, you cannot have faith in God if you are leaning to your own understanding. You remember when you were a child? Your parents couldn't explain everything to you. There were some things that you just had to obey, even though you didn't understand it, you were too young to. The same thing is true with our Father. There are things we won't understand in this life. But if faith waits for an explanation, faith will never come. Faith is believing God even when we don't understand. We have to trust him. And we observe him ordering our steps. Now the final thing I want to say is this. The Father loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Don't get me wrong, you're all wonderful people. But God loves you too much to leave us the way that we are. Never despise God's discipline 
He wants you to fulfill the potential that he has given you. In Proverbs 3, 11 to 12, it says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. God delights in you. And that's a wonderful thought. I really want you to see that you have no idea what you, with God's help, are capable of. You simply don't know. And I've experienced myself God's refining, and let me say this, refining is never pleasant. It really isn't, and at least not for me. Maybe I'm not spiritual enough, but when God starts to do some refining in you, and listen, when God has a purpose for you, which he does, you will have to go through some refining, and it will not be pleasant. Believe you me, it won't. I mean, in my case, I've had it where, seriously, I've I really had to come to the end of myself because it was that bad. And he then realized, I guess this is what God wanted all along, for me to come to the end of myself. And I've experienced God have to correct me and change mindsets and attitudes and so on. It's never pleasant at the time but I take courage from it because it means God believes in me. He knows and only he knows what he's called me to be. He and only he knows what he's called you to be. And if you were to ever see it, it would shock you. But it's good. And so you have to let God take you through the refining because you come out as pure gold. And here's the thing. In the heavenly Jerusalem, the streets of gold, he says that it's so pure that it's transparent. I'm not sure if you noticed that in the book of Revelation. The gold is so pure, it's transparent. And that's the whole point. When you are purified, guess what people will see in you? The one who lives in you. You'll be transparent. Let me put it simply. You need to die. All of us do. So that like this, famous pastor's rubbish props. Like this glass, come on now. Transparent. I have water in there. If I had something else, you'd be able to see it. Can people see the Jesus in you? That's what God wants, for Jesus to be seen in every single one of you. So let me summarize this message. Jesus shows us what God is like. Jesus came to share his Father with us, You know you belong to God. God has chosen us to be his children. Sonship is something that we have and is also something that we are growing into. Our adoption will be complete when our bodies are redeemed. Because God is your father, you don't need to worry about anything. The father will only give us what is good. The father loves you too much to leave you the way you are. And we thank God for his word. I'm going to pray at this time. If, um, whilst I'm praying, Wincy, could you kindly...